Welcome back to the Rehab for Runners podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Lisa, and today we have dietitian Emily Moore. Welcome, Emily. Hi, thanks for having me. Excited to chat about fueling. Yeah, same. I'm excited to have you here too, because we've actually worked an in-person workshop for those listening. And I know that when you teach something, it's like so practical. So I am excited to dive in today. We're going to be talking about fueling for longer runs. So let's just start with like an overview of the importance of fueling when you are running a longer run. Okay, perfect. So the first thing I want you to think about is how helpful food, eating, and nutrition is. It's a positive tool that's going to help you feel good in your daily life. We don't need to be afraid of food. We don't need to be afraid of calories. It's something that's going to help us feel good, help us live long, stay healthy, and support all of our running goals and dreams that we have. So I know today we're going to chat a lot about like fueling long runs and races, uh, but we don't want to forget about daily nutrition as our strong nutrition foundation that's going to set us up and be really great to build from and build in those running nutrition pieces. So what I mean by running nutrition is like you're fueling before, during, and after long runs and races. Awesome. Yeah, because it's not just about like what you eat during a run it's also like pretty much everything else you eat that absolutely yeah makes sense Mm -hmm. i feel like that's something we kind of forget about as runners it's like oh i just have to eat this one thing before run and during a run and then after and then i can kind of eat whatever but i mean we really are athletes even if you don't consider yourself like a competitive runner, you're still an athlete. So you still need to be fueling like one, especially if you want to improve your performance. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Your body, your muscles, your whole body needs fuel in order to accomplish what you want to accomplish in your daily life and in your running. So yeah, all starts with daily nutrition for sure. Awesome. So When should you start thinking about fueling for a long run? Like, say I'm new to fueling. I'm like, all right, I feel like I'm running on E or I feel like I'm hitting a wall. Like, when do you think, obviously I should be fueling, but when do you think I should (laughs) consider like thinking about fueling? Like, what would you consider like the, I guess the cutoff line when you should start fueling? Mm -hmm. So when we look at our sports nutrition guidelines, it, we, it recommends to start fueling, hydrating, taking electrolytes when we're running over an hour. So like generally I recommend if you're running 75, 90 minutes, like we need to fuel early in the run and throughout the entire run so that we can go the distance. And when we talk about during run fuel, we're talking about carbohydrates, which can come from food. I mean, there's a wide variety of foods that can provide carbs during running. And then our sports products, which we usually think of first, like our gels, our chews. And when we are out there running, what we're doing is we're dipping into our glycogen store. So I think of it as like your fuel tank. And those stores, if we're eating enough carbs and we're fully optimizing those stores leading up to the run, those stores generally get depleted or exhausted around like 90 to 120 minutes of running. So when we're out there running for a long period of time, we want to take in fuel to, um, what's the word? We want to take in fuel to, so that we're not just using up all of our stores and our reserves right then and there, but we're taking in fuel to kind of delay that and to keep us fueled and energized, especially when our stores get depleted. We don't want to hit that wall, which is really common. Like I'd say in the half marathon, mile 10 ish, 11 ish. And then in the marathon, I'd say like 18 to 20. That's typically when people hit the wall. Yes. I know the wall all too well. Mm -hmm. Me (laughs) Um, too. (laughs) I feel like everyone, when you're running like a half or like it's like when's the wall gonna come but are you saying that if we stay on top of fueling and like I know there's other reasons for hitting the wall but like if we stay on top of fueling and we don't deplete all of our energy then we can decrease our like I guess I don't even know if it's a risk but like chances 
yeah. chances of hitting the wall, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How we fuel leading up to a long run, leading up to a long race, how we fuel during, how we hydrate, take electrolytes, like all of that can help us have a strong race and avoid hitting that dreaded wall that we all, you know, don't want to hit and we want to do our best to avoid. Oh, that's awesome. That is music to my ears. All right. So... (laughs) So when you say that we are depleting our glycogen storage, like we, I understand we don't want to just run it to the ground. You know, we want to stay on top of it. So is that like when we're hitting a wall, does that mean we are, we have gone through everything and we are now in like depletion, like we are on E basically? Yeah, I would say so for sure. Yeah. And I mean, there's fatigue and running a race is always going to be hard. Like I feel like all the half marathons and marathons I've run, like we always get so humbled by them and it's like, okay, this is like the marathon number, blah, blah, blah. But it like never gets easier. Right. So there's going to be that element. Um, but that like feeling of like, I can't go anymore. I'm just like, I have no energy to keep going. The chances of feeling that way can be decreased through proper nutrition, I will, am going to stress leading up to the long run and race and then during. Yes. Yes. Okay. That makes sense. So, and that goes hand in hand with us trying to improve our performance because, you know, if I'm like, Emily, I want to improve my performance. I don't want to hit a wall. Like, would you consider those two things like almost like the same goal? Like you would give me the same plan or like recommend the same amount of fueling for the same for those two things? Fueling depends on, so I would say that not hitting a wall and performing well, I would say that those aren't necessarily the same things because there's a big difference between having a strong race and feeling really good up to the end through the finish and like just getting by, you know? So those I wouldn't say are necessarily the same things. Um, Where was I going with that? Um, all right. Well, (laughs) so I'll ask another question because I don't even know if that made sense. Um, okay. So then if I want to improve my running performance and I want to improve my speed, how would that, how would my feeling strategy change? Yeah. So when we look at our, and I I remember what I was going to say, when we look at our sports guidelines, it's our fueling is dependent on the duration of running. So a lot of times people say like, hey, Emily, I'm running like 10 miles. How much fuel do I need? And it depends on how long that 10 miles is going to take you. So when we're running generally about an hour to two and a half hours, we want to aim for like 30 to 60 or more grams of carbs per hour of running. So we hit that every single hour throughout the run. When we're, you know, over two and a half hours, so I would say like marathons, um, maybe half, but marathons for most people, we fall into that category. We need, we're going to be out there running longer. So we need more fuel each hour so that we can make it out there that long. So we want to aim for 60 to 90 or more grams of carbs per hour when we're running over that two and a half hours. Uh, And we all, we want to practice all of this during training. So you know, I work with and runners on a one on one basis to find out like where, you know, what products do they like that uh, works for them and their body for fuel. Same with, you know, fluids and electrolytes here, but I know we're just chatting through fuel right now. So the products, the amount, uh, everyone's kind of different with what they can handle. And I will say that it takes time. It takes practice. Like you can train your body to take in fuel, absorb that fuel, use that fuel better the more that we practice. And we all want to do that all during training before we get to race day. So yes, to answer your question, you know, if we want to have strong races, if we want to, you, we, maybe we have like time goals, finish time goals that we want to hit, uh, figuring out all of this during training and seeing, trying to optimize and seeing where we can really get you, how many grams of carbs per hour feels good for you that can hopefully align with our sports guidelines that we just chatted through. Okay. That makes sense. So if I'm, if I'm training for a longer race and I, you know, I have these goals in mind is my, 
because you mentioned like if the run is over two and a half hours, is my race day strategy going to be similar to a long run that's over two and a half hours in terms of the amount of carbs I'm taking in? Or would that be different because I'm running at a different pace? Um, it would be similar because again, we're not, you know, our, our sports guidelines aren't necessarily based on pace. It's based on duration of running though. I will say that when you're running faster, you're probably going to be utilizing fuel quicker, right? So you might need more. Um, but like we want to create, and I really encourage runners to do this all the time. Like we want to create your race day plan and really work on optimizing and getting to our goals for fluids, for electrolytes, for carbs during our training, because it can take time. Like it's taken some of my runners like weeks and weeks to like really increase their carb, maybe from like 30 grams to, to 70, 75 grams an hour. And, and I wouldn't suggest doing that, you know, overnight. So it takes time to kind of slowly increase, but you generally want to be practicing your race day nutrition plan during your training. So it's not like you'll get to race day and then you have way different targets or, you know, use different products or anything crazy like that. Yes. Yes. Do not do that. Don't do anything new on race day, <laughs> even though I did something semi new on race day and it kind of worked out. I added in, um, speaking of fueling, I added in caffeine like two weeks before uh, race day just to test it. And luckily everything was fine, but um, that was kind of frisky. I will say I was nervous, but um, what are some examples of some fueling that, you know, someone can practice with? Because I know it's going to depend on like what your stomach can handle and like what kind of texture you like, what flavors you like, what brands, but do you have any favorites for specific like fuel during a run? Yep. So when we talk about fuel, again, we're talking about carbohydrates and we can get that through actually three different sources, food, sports products, and fluids like our sports drinks. So when it comes to food, banana chips, pretzels are popular, dates, um, shout out to my running buddy, but she likes Swedish fish, peanut butter M&Ms, you know, that type of thing she likes. Uh, so those are the types of food that may work for some people. Um, as far as sports products go, gels, um, I'm a big you can fan. So I've just really over the last year, I've like basically only used you can to fuel. I uh, used Mar Martin gels before, which is a very different gel experience. Have you tried those? That's what I tried before the race. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and they're I like jello, <laughs> like a jello shot, right? Yeah. <laughs> I think of it as like, but it like doesn't have flavor. So that's just like very odd to me. I'm just like, okay, just get it down. Like you don't even chew it. You just have to swallow like it. swallow it. Yeah. So than you can. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And you can's like thinner consistency. The taste reminds me like it's a like fruity and sour. And it does remind me of like a Greek yogurt or one of those Chobani shakes. You've had you can. I love you can. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I would me agree. Too. It's like, it's a little grainy to me too, but not in like a bad mm. way. Cause that doesn't sound great, but I really, really like it. I feel like when, um, going like, I love Swedish fish and gummy bears too, but I notice when, especially at the end of a run, like I'll almost like get an energy burst and then like crash. So I like that you can is more of like, or they say that it's more level, but I do actually feel that when I'm running mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Spring energy is also a, a popular one. Huma gel, Huma gel plus, those are all ones that I've, you know, had and enjoy. And I'd say that are on the popular side. Goo is also, I know Richmond marathon. We we're just talking about Richmond marathon, but I think they provide goo from my memory. They do. Right. Yep. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and then like Fair. choose. Yeah. I, I don't love that one either, but some people do. It's all about finding what you like and what works for you, right? Yep, exactly. 
And you were saying like chews and then like um, carbs that you can drink too, because that's a, definitely a good option. Um, yeah. Especially if it's hot, you're already drinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, chews like the Cliff Blocks. Um, I think I tested those out recently. I'm a runner that doesn't like to chew when I run. So the like food chews do not work for me. Like I'd rather just like suck it down and keep going. Like not have to sit there and chew and take, you know, take more. But again, works for some people. Sports beans is another one. And then something that I think is super helpful, especially with Oh my, it checks so many boxes. So for sports drinks that have carbs, that have sugar, no, we don't need to be scared of sugar when we run. Our body uses sugar for fuel. It's okay. If there's sugar in your fuel source, whatever, it's okay. <laughs> we want it there. Uh, like noon endurance. Um, let's see, Gatorade, Gatorade endurance, Scratch Labs. All of those products are really great because they have carbs so it can contribute to your hourly carb intake and help you reach those goals and they have electrolytes so you know and you're not gonna have it straight up right you're gonna mix it with fluid or you're gonna take a cup on course that is mixed so it really kind of checks all those three boxes we want to check all those three boxes every single hour when we're out there running and I find like for me, when I'm marathon training, it's so helpful to get me more carbs per hour and to help me reach those goals. If I do gel every 30 minutes, plus I don't, I personally don't drink plain water when I'm marathon running. Uh, I just drink Same. electrolytes uh, and Same. the carbs and the electrolytes is so helpful in like getting me an extra 20 plus grams of carbs per hour. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that's super helpful. I know you mentioned carbs a lot because you know, <laughs> open social media and everyone's afraid of carbs, but obviously runners should not be because that's what we're using for fuel. But I know there are different types of carbs from my one nutrition class back in like 10 years ago. Um, so should we be eating like certain carbs, a mix of both or how does that work? So when we are fueling above 60 grams of carbs per hour, we really want to try to get a blend of carb types. Now, generally, we have fructose, we have glucose and maltodextrin. And we don't want, you know, let's say we're choosing, I don't know, one of the gels that like basically provides glucose. We don't want to be fueling at 70, 75, 80 grams an hour of straight glucose because we have these different transporters that sit on our small intestine where we absorb the sugar, uh, where we absorb like the simple carb. And glucose transporter, for example, that gets saturated around 60 grams of carbs an hour. So when we're throwing 70, 80 grams at it an hour, it could just oversaturate that transporter and could potentially cause some GI issues. So uh, I think like, I wish I had my facts up here, but I'm pretty sure like Martin gel is a mixture of fructose and glucose. Like if you go to the ingredients, so that would be a really great one, a great blend of carbohydrate types. And, you know, with that, it would be easy to hit that 90 gram per hour or more mark and be able to tolerate that because there's different carb types in there that are using different transporters on your small intestine for absorption. Wow. That's so helpful. That's so helpful. So we definitely want to mix, not just like one type. You want to mix it up as you're running. Especially when you're fueling at like those high amounts each hour. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, makes, that definitely makes sense. Um, let's talk a little bit about like carb loading because you have mentioned it's not just what you eat, you know, right before run or during a run or after run. It's also like days leading up. So in terms of carb intake, is there, should we be eating like a certain amount of carbs? Should we be slowly increasing our carbs? Um, or like, what do you recommend for someone who, you know, maybe their long run is on Saturday and they want to start like incorporating more carbs so they don't mm -hmm. crash during their long run? Yeah. So I actually, for daily nutrition, I have a series of runner's plates that I love. Um, 
basically it's an easy day, uh, moderate day and hard day runner's plates. And when we're out there running, you know, long runs, I consider over an hour. So when they're, we're out there running over an hour, we really want to optimize our plate and actually fill it half of it with grains and starches. So think of like your bread, think of your rice, your pasta, uh, potatoes, that type of thing. 50% of your plate should be covered by those types of foods. And then you have your source of protein. You could have like a little bit of like fruit or vegetable on there, source of fat, but it's really should be carb heavy or carb based. Uh, so that is what I recommend leading up to that long run is actually focus on that hard training plate, which depending on what your activity looks like and exercise looks like, it might be something that you do for breakfast, lunch, and dinner all week long. And with carb loading in particular, carb loading is very race specific. So we carb load for races and we carb load for races that are going to take us over 90 minutes. So half marathons, marathons could fit well within that category. And we want to carb load for the two to three days leading up to that race. So for marathons, I always recommend full three days uh, for a half, like two days is good for carb loading. And it's good to practice to one, create your plan, to practice that plan during your training. So that way we know like, okay, what's going to work? What do you like? What do you need to change? And then you have an opportunity to practice a day, one, just one day of your carb load the day before a long training run. So that way when you carb load for real, the days leading up to your race, it's like not this new thing or you don't have any, you know, issues with, let's say, food, too much food, like food volume. And it's like, okay, now we have to figure out, now we have to change our plan right before the race. And we, you don't want to mess around with that. You have enough to focus on right before the race. Yeah. Oh, that's so helpful. Okay. Got it. So definitely like slowly incorporating more carbs making sure that we're getting enough carbs. Do you find that a lot of runners don't get enough carbs like leading up to a, a harder workout, longer run? I find that runners don't eat enough carbs in general because we have a lot of fear when it comes to carbohydrates. You know, we see uh, carbs being demonized all the time, right? Like diet culture demonizes carbs and, you know, low carb this, low carb that. But we need carbs as runners, as we've talked about today, we need them as runners and we're going to get burnt out. We're not going to have the energy to do what we want to do in our daily life and then throw training on top of it. Like we can burn ourselves out for sure. So it's not something that we need to be afraid of and it can require some mindset work to get past and work through any type of fears when it comes to carbohydrates. So I do a lot of work actually with a lot of clients to work on changing that mindset to more of an optimization mindset of like, let's try to optimize your meals and snacks with as many nutrients as we can. Let's try to, you know, increase our carbohydrates instead of focusing on taking things away. I don't believe in good foods, bad foods, you know, foods have no moral value. So it can take some mindset work, but carbs is, I find the things that the macronutrient that runners, it's common for runners to fall short on. And a lot of our strategies and interventions during training is let's add some more carbs here. Let's add some more carbs here. That's awesome. Yeah. I've seen like on your Instagram, you always have like the best meals and it always I can like see all the nutrients in there and I'm like wow I need to like take notes and actually like add more nutrients but it makes sense because it's like let's add because again going back to like we're athletes we are training like athletes um, even if we're not super competitive you know we're still training like athletes and we need to be therefore eating like athletes so I like mm -hmm. the idea of like adding in versus like saying this is a bad food, this is a good food, because it really is, I mean, it's all over social media, it's all over Netflix even, and like the TV and everything, where it's just like, just eat high protein, low carb, but then as endurance athletes, that's, you can just basically block that out, we don't need to listen to that, because you definitely need, as you explained, you need those carbs. 
Yeah, I always tell runners, you are unique. You aren't just your average person. You are unique and your nutrition needs are unique. And we need to eat probably a lot different than our non-runner friends, family, even partners. Like I'm pretty sure I, every day I eat more than my husband, you know, <laughs> but like I have different needs as a runner. So that's another piece too is like, okay, I can be eating more than people around me, but I'm going to do what I have to do to reach my goals and to take care of me. So yeah, definitely. So you mentioned electrolytes and I want to touch on this just a little bit, um, saying like, you know, if you're taking in a certain fluid that it's going to cover your electrolytes, is there a certain amount of electrolytes we should be taking in per hour during a long run? Mm hmm. Yep. So we actually lose five different electrolytes through our sweat. We lose sodium, chloride and potassium, magnesium and calcium. We lose the most like sodium chloride followed by potassium and then we lose smaller amounts of calcium and magnesium. Um, so with that being said, we do have a very specific sports guideline for sodium and that is when we are just in general, when we're running over an hour, we want to hydrate during runs. We want to take in those electrolytes. For sodium specifically, it's 300 to 600 or more milligrams of sodium per hour of running. And you can definitely get that through some gels like Huma Gel Plus. Uh, again, I wish I had my labels in front of me here, but I'm pretty sure there's 240 milligrams of sodium, which is a pretty good amount for a gel. That's a higher amount compared to a lot of the other gels. Uh, so that in combination with a sports drink. That could definitely help you meet that need. Or, you know, if a sports drink's really not your thing, we want to make sure we're taking electrolyte capsules, electrolyte chews, salt stick is a popular one. So that can help us get some sodium in outside of a sports drink. Gotcha. Yeah, I definitely, I like the salt sticks, but I need to try those gels that have a ton of sodium. But would <laughs> you... Do you like to change up like how much sodium you're taking? Because I know those are guidelines, but do you like to change it up in the summer versus the winter? So what has helped me with my individual losses and needs is actually to take a sweat test. And there are different companies out there that provide them. I'd say like most popular is H-Drop, if you've seen any uh Yep. like marketing for them. Uh, it's like a reusable band that goes around your arm. Leveland is also a company that does sweat tests. They'll send them to you in the mail and then you, you know, wear your patch and then send it back and they'll email you your results, I believe. Um, I have personal experience with H-Drop and not Leveland, but a lot of sports dietitians use Leveland for their athletes. But you could see, which is amazing, you could see your sweat rate so how much fluid you're losing per hour of running. And you can also see your sweat electrolyte composition. So for me, um, I can lose well over a liter of fluid per hour. And along with that, a thousand plus milligrams of sodium per hour. Wow. So I am, and I already knew this about myself before I even took a sweat test. I am a heavy sweater, like especially in the summertime. When I get home, it looks like I took a shower or jumped into a pool. Uh, I also am a very salty sweater and I'm covered with salt crystals on my skin after long runs. So those are some signs of being a heavy, saltier sweater. So that is a route that I sometimes take with my clients if we're concerned about their fluids or if they've had, you know, hyponatremia in the past, which basically comes from overhydrating. So our, our hydration needs are up here. They're higher, but our sweat rate is down here. So we're really drinking too much fluid per hour, especially if we're drinking a bunch of plain water that can contribute to a dangerous condition called exercise associated hyponatremia, you know, seizures, um, 
I'm pretty sure if I've experienced this like way early in my long distance running career, but nausea, vomiting, like I felt like really kind of weird in the head, you know, for the rest of the day, headaches, even like death. So it's nothing to play around with. Uh, but that is definitely a concern for endurance athletes and why we don't just want to go out there, run for hours and just drink plain water. We need to take electrolytes. Oh, okay. That, that actually is like very interesting. So get a, get a sweat test, run in it, send it in. And then do you, do they email you back? Like if you need to, how much like sodium you should be taking in per hour? So I can't speak to that like from personal experience because I've, for Levelin, that company, I've never actually done one of their sweat tests. I probably should so I could speak more to it. Um, I used H-Drop. So H-Drop is like a band that you wear around your arm. You It connects to an app on your phone and it generates a report. So I believe Leveland emails you your results after and it will tell you, you know, your sweat rate and it should tell you your uh, sweat electrolyte composition. Uh, and then so does H drop as well. It just connects to your phone and you get this report like a few minutes after you finish a run and hit, you know, done running. So I would suggest that if that's a route that you want to go, I would suggest like working with a dietitian there to like figure out then how to create your plan based on your results. Yeah, that definitely makes sense because I'm sure some of the things that they say, it's hard to interpret not mm -hmm. being a dietitian, and then you'll be able to, you know, tweak someone's sodium intake. Yeah. And like electrolyte intake during, before, during, and after. So if it's, you know, hot, long run, over the weekend, I know electrolytes are important like throughout the week, making sure that you're, you know, staying up with it, but... Do you recommend taking them before the run, during the run, after the run, or depends on someone's like how much sweat or how much sodium they're sweating out or electrolytes are sweating out or what would you say on that? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, I think it depends, but I would say if you have especially higher sweat rates, like you're like me and you look drenched after a long run, if you're, you know, high humidity, hot temperatures, salty sweater, I would say it wouldn't hurt to do an electrolyte beverage even the night before with dinner. So the night before, even the morning of, taking those electrolytes, hydrating the best that you can during, uh, and then replenishing afterwards. And a lot of times we think of electrolytes as like supplements, like your uh, Element or your Scratch Labs or Gatorade, right? But don't forget too, especially during your week away from that long run, like we could get electrolytes through food. So that's also something to think about too. Sodium and chloride, like table salt. We can add a little extra salt to foods. We can eat. There's nothing better than a post long run pickle or a post long run pickle juice. Okay. Great way to replenish <laughs> sodium. That is like, I always have pickle jar in my fridge because that's what I enjoy after a long run. Yep. I had a pickle shot after my Tony Miler in the fall and <laughs> this is not something I would normally take, but it was definitely helping. It's so salty. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It, it works. It does the job that you want it to do, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's funny. Um, awesome. So do you have any advice for those who maybe they're training for a new distance this fall, starting to get into more of a quote, longer run for them? What advice do you have for those who have never fueled before? So I have some advice for those who've never fueled, but this advice also might help people who have already started to fuel their running and racing. Um, the feed is a really great website. I recently got my first purchase from the feed delivered in the mail. The feed's cool because you can order like one of something. You can order one gel and one chew from a completely different company. And you can order a little pack of individual electrolytes and it all comes to you in one box and you don't have to buy like a whole box of one gel and then figure out what to do with it when you don't like that gel. So the feed is really cool for 
shopping for products, your local running stores like Fleet Feet. I've gone in there for some fuel before to get just like one of something to try. Uh, I would suggest that if you are new to fueling during running and even like drinking or taking electrolytes, like you can start slow and then slowly build over time. Maybe you just do, and I'd actually recommend like do one new whether it be food or gel or electrolyte pack, like do one per run, narrow down to see what you like. Um, you know, you don't have to, of course, force fuel. There's going to be an option out there for you, but you could even start with like half a gel and then increase to one gel an hour and then maybe increase to one and a half. You can do it at a pace that feels good for you. But of course, yes, we need to do this during our training and give ourselves time to do this. So yeah, you could start small and build up over time. I will say that if you're training for a race and you plan to take what's on the course, please go to your race website and look to see what's going to be available on that course. Uh, we don't want to try any new things during our race that we haven't done during training. I've had, you know, you mentioned an experience, but I had an experience at my first Richmond Marathon few years ago at mile 18 is like that junk food stop. You know what I'm talking yep. about? Yep. yep. And I never have I ever had any candy, gummies, never, nothing like that I've ever had during training. But you know, at mile 18, you're like, okay, I have like, I've run a lot of miles, but I still got a lot, of, lot to go. Maybe I could use some sort of gummy or whatever to help me feel energized for these next few miles. And I took gummies. Nope. Wrong decision. I, my digestive tract like did not like that. I started cramping and it's not the greatest way to finish, especially a first marathon. So if you plan to do anything like that ahead of time, just start practicing and seeing if you like it, seeing how your body handles it during your training. Um, and if you don't know, like I ran the Ashland half marathon in, in March and it just said noon for the electrolyte drink. There's a big difference between noon sport and noon endurance. One has no, like one's kind of fizzy, noon sport is fizzy and has electrolytes, great source of electrolytes, really poor source of carb. And I like to, again, rely on carb for from the sports drink to help me meet my my hourly goals. And then noon endurance has a completely different taste. It's not fizzy and it's higher, much higher in carb. So I actually emailed my race and I said, hey, which product's gonna be available? Thank goodness it was noon endurance and I bought that and I started practicing with that during training. So just make sure to do that if you're going, yeah, do make sure to just do that if you're going to take stuff from the course. And I will say that the one to two gel that they give you at mile 10 or whatever during a marathon or a half is not enough to fuel a marathon or a half. Bring your own fuel in addition to what is going to be provided. That's such good advice. Yes. I actually love the noon endurance. I also love the Gatorade endurance. I'll usually like switch them like, you know, the lemon lime. I think they both taste really good. Um, but I need to definitely try some others, but, and I need to try the feed because I'm getting so many ads for it <laughs> <laughs> and I need to just do it. But I think that's a great way to like sample some fuel. And then you can also look at the nutrition of the fuel and start mm -hmm. to strategize your, what you're going to do for a long run, because it really is a strategy, just like, you know, how your run is a strategy, fueling's a strategy before, during, and after. That's something I've definitely learned. Mm -hmm. I will say the last thing too, I have another recommendation or tip. The last thing that I'll say too is also, if you're running a race, know what is going to be allowed in terms of hydration, packs, vests. Um, I only learned this through word of mouth or maybe a Facebook group that I was a part of. But when I was training for the New York City Marathon, all summer long in my nice, you know, nice vest, wore my hydration vest. They don't allow those at the New York City Marathon. Oh, so no. I thankfully, like, Thought, found out about this, thought about it, you know, months in advance. And I had to really switch up 
and get used to running with a handheld. So it's okay if you're carrying your fluids differently than you would on race day, but don't bring your hydration vest to the race thinking you can use it and then have them take it away, you know? So just no surprises on race day. Yeah, that's a good tip. Um, Yeah, a lot of races don't allow it, which is kind of surprising in a way. So you would think it's just less that they have to provide too, but... Yeah, I want it's probably ties back to safety, I'm guessing, but yeah, especially for larger races. But yeah, I'm not exactly sure. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Emily, for joining us. Where can my listeners find you? Yep. So um, I'm on Instagram and I'm very active on there. So I usually have lots of posts and stories and tips to share. Um, it's the dietitian runner. Dietitian is with two T's, no C's. <laughs> Um, and my website is dietitianrunner.com. Awesome. I will link that below. Thanks for clarifying that <laughs> because is that how you spell dietitian without a C? Um, yes, here in the U S I will say that I do see it with a C. I was on a podcast recently and it was with a C and I was like, Oh, it's like the one thing, like as a dietitian, like no C's is with two T's. <laughs> That's good to know. I'll make sure. I <laughs> it's not, it's not that big of a deal. I'm not going to get all bent out of shape about that, but still. <laughs> That's funny. Well, thank you so much, Emily. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.